And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. There are some games that when they come out make a splash, and Rex is certainly one of those. And you say, what? What is this Rex? Is this a game about a dog or a person? And no, if you look carefully, it's actually called Twilight Imperium Rex, Final Days of the Empire. <laughs> Does that mean this is a new Twilight Imperium expansion or spin-off game? Well, yes and no. It's not an expansion. It is a spin-off game, but it's really not a spin-off game. And that's because Rex, if you haven't heard about this, if you're in the gaming world at all, you've known about this for a long time but Rex is the very 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 long awaited reprint of Dune now Dune the board game is about as old as I am it was designed by the same guys who made Cosmic Encounter and it is a classic game uh, that took the book of Dune and put it into a board game where you felt it very well all the powers and everything unfortunately when Fantasy Flight Games was able to get the license from these designers, they were not able to get the license for the theme of Dune from the Frank Herbert estate, May They Burn Up. Um, thanks a lot, guys, for nothing. But anywho, so they had to put it in the Twilight Imperium universe, which is a universe I enjoy, and in fact, as far as I know, has only really been used in Twilight Imperium. So. I wasn't as upset over some people. I mean, I think I probably signed a petition that someone sent me, but I didn't, it wasn't going to go anywhere. We want the Dune theme. Yeah, 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 but it didn't happen. Okay, so what? Is this game good? Well, it's pretty much a faithful reprint with minor changes. Well, let me stop talking about that. Let's look at it. Right. There is a lot going on in this game, and I don't really have time to go over every aspect of the game, so I'm just going to talk about some of the things. Also, I'd like to point out at this point that while this game is essentially Dune reskinned, as I said in the original thing, I'm not going to take time pointing out every difference between that game and this game. I'll say that they're functionally identical. There are some changes to the game, and you might see some of those in my review here. And I'm not going to say, for example, these guys are the uh, certain race in uh, Dune. So, that being said, if you've never played Dune before, fear not. We're going to take a closer look at this game for what it is. Each person is going to get a faction. And each of these factions is one of the races from the Twilight Imperium universe. And each of these factions is really completely different than the other factions. The Federation of Jolnar, the Emirates of Hassan, the Lazic Empire. And this game is going to take place over eight rounds of this game. Depending on which group you take, you're going to get a pile of people for that uh, specific race. So let's say, for example, you pick the Federation of Sol. You want to be the humans. Well, then you're going to get all these blue pieces here. You're going to have two cards that you can use if you make an alliance with someone else. You have these hexagonal pieces, which are basically going to be uh, units, troops that you'll have on the board that you'll fight with. And then you have some leaders. And each place has, each person has five leaders. So here you have a leader who's six, a leader value five, a leader value seven, a leader value two, and a leader who's a value of three. And you'll have these, everyone knows what leaders you have. You have to tell everyone what leaders you have, but um, in case you don't, there is a card, and you can see here, it tells you the values of the leaders of each of the six different people. Now, the six different races are very different. Each race is going to have a specific setup, and you can see here that the, this guy has starts with three influence. Influence is kind of like money in the course of this game. Uh, they have ten units in reserve. They're going to start with ten units distributed as you like in sectors 5, 13, and 16, so they can put different units on the board. Uh, a real quick mention about the board. The board has different segment sectors on it that are connected with lines and that's how you move from one sector to another sector. You might have noticed that this game comes with this giant fleet. That is no player's fleet. That's actually just a giant fleet that's going around bombarding the planet and will betide you if it comes in a sector where you are. But we'll talk about that in a moment. So each player is a starting thing 
But more so than that, each player has specific race advantages. For example, this guy, most people can move their units two spaces. Well, he can move his three. He's immune to certain cards where this, this fleet is bombarding. He's less worried about that than other players because he can see where the fleet's going. It's, it's kind of his fleet. It still can hurt him. Um, and also, he can deploy units for free in certain spots on the board. And he has a special victory condition that if nobody has won by round eight, and he controls two spots on the board, or nobody controls those spots, then he is the winner. And so that's a very unusual uh, thing, and, I, and, and we should talk about that right now. This game has some really fun victory conditions. There are different spaces here on the board, and different spaces have different things. For example, uh, you can see this cultural sector here has a little green icon under that. That means it's shields, so it's immune to that fleet uh, when it's bombarding. Uh, this one over here uh, has a little blue icon, and that basically means that influence can show up in that region. And so you might want to go there to get influence. But what we're really worried about is down here, the Adamus and Perilous has a little red icon. That is one of the strongholds of this game. There are five of these strongholds. You can see there's another one up here, uh, the civilian spaceport. And there are five of these in the game. And if you control a certain amount of those at the end of a turn you win. Well, what is that certain amount? Well, it's completely different depending on how many players are allied together. If one player does it by themselves and they get three of them, three of the five, they win. If two players are allied together, they need four of them to win. And if three players are allied together, they need to have all five of them and then they'll win the game. But that's not it. If no one wins the game by turn eight, then the Emirates of Hassan will automatically win. That's just how it works. Unless, of course, these guys control those two areas, then they win. But there's more than that. We have the Cha Kingdom. And now that I've said that, I'm going to get 20 emails from people telling me, how could you not know how to pronounce their name? Uh, but the Double X Cha guys, at the beginning of the game, they have some round tokens that they will use with and they will predict what round and what player will win the game. And if they are correct, if that player wins during that round, or is part of an alliance that wins during that round, then they win the game instead of that player. Whew! That seems like a lot to keep track of, but it's really not. But you never know who the victory conditions might change and might win. So each of these players has very specific special abilities. And each turn, there's going to be a, a few things that are happening over the course of a turn. First, you're going to be auctioning off these action cards. You'll be using the influence to auction off these cards. And these cards are cards that can be used in battle. They can, there can, you can even destroy one of the shields of one of these places. Uh, they, they can mess with different things on, on the board. And they're very powerful cards. And so there's a, a bit of an auction phase. And after the auction phase is over, you have one card that you'll put out per player. But however, one person can win multiple cards. Then after that, then players are going to start moving pieces on the board and attacking each other. Now when your pieces die, they go up here and your leaders die and you can buy them back for influence, but it is expensive. But you can recruit units back and then when you deploy units, since they're being deployed from space, you can deploy them in any empty spot. You can even deploy them in a spot where there's other people. It's more expensive to do so. And when you move into a spot or when you deploy to a spot where there's an enemy, then a battle occurs. I've wanted to get to this part of the game because this is the part of the game that separates it from anyone else. You have these battle wheels. Each player is going to take a battle wheel. So let's say, for example, that I am being attacked by the evil red guys. And they come in and they have a special ability where they have these double-sized units that count as two. And so they come in with two of those and two of the small ones. So they have six. And they're attacking me and I have four. Now, I'm going to have to sit here and decide, okay, I have four units. I can commit all four of them to battle. See the little wheel there? You can commit as many troops as you want to battle up to the number you have. But if I win... I'm going to lose all those troops that I committed. So I might only want to commit three so that I have at least one troop left over. However, if I don't win, I lose all my troops. But that's, that's not all that's going to matter. I also get to pick one of my leaders secretly, and I'm going to put him in one of these spots. There's four spots here on the side. If I put him here, 
that means I'm not going to play any cards this turn. If I put them here, it means I'm going to play an attack card. Here I'm going to play one defense card, and here I'm going to play one attack and one defense card. And so, once we both pick, okay, so he picks his leader, then we show them, and he says, okay, he had six people, and he put in four of them. So four plus three is seven, um, five plus three, eight, I'm the winner, and all his units, even though he had more units than me, are destroyed, and I lose three of my units. But that might not even be the end of it, because each of us has a chance to play the cards that we were going to play. And many of the cards will often kill your opponent's leader. But there's just as many cards that will stop the card that's going to kill your leader. And so you might be careful about sending out a very strong leader, because he might be one that, that, they, that when they kill him, then you don't get to use that leader anymore. And so that's the way combat works. But wait, there's more. At the beginning of the game, and this is by far probably my favorite thing about this game in general, and that is this. At the beginning of the game, each player is going to draw four of these cards. And these cards show every leader in the game. And you look at them, and you're going to pick one of those leaders. And that leader is now working for you. They are a traitor. Unless, of course, you're playing my favorite race, the Barony of Letnev. You get to keep all four. So you have four traitors working for you. But if you attack somebody else and they happen to use the leader for which you have this card, you reveal it and they automatically lose everything. Of course, you lose the traitor card, the leader dies, you know, uh, and so you've lost your traitor. But that can be a critical point and can be hilarious. After everybody has fought their wars, um, there, there will often be influence appearing at different spots on the board due to, uh, due to card draws, and people are going to collect that influence, and then you go to the next turn. And it, it's very simple in that regard. You move, fight, see if anyone's met any victory conditions, and go on. But it's the interaction of all the players, uh, just how they, how they do things. So, uh, these guys, the double X Cha guys, they can uh, command their opponent not to play a very specific card. The... We already talked about the Federation of Seoul, the University of Jolnar. They can, they can find out one thing that their opponent's going to do. You can tell me your, which leader you're using. Tell me which attack card you're using. Tell me uh, what defense card you're using. Uh, and they also can secretly look at these cards to see which one they are. And so there's uh, lots of different things that people can do. But another interesting thing about this game... And this is something I, I think is unusual to this game, is that one of these cards is going to be turned over at the beginning of each round. And many times it just shows you where influence is placed on the board, in two different spots, so people can go and pick that up. But other times, it's going to be the sole offensive. And any space uh, that has influence on the board, the place that had the biggest influence, is going to be destroyed. All the units and influence there is destroyed, and this is removed from the game. So you got to be careful about having too much stuff in one spot. But what's really interesting here are these temporary ceasefire cards. When this card comes up, immediately players can make alliances. In fact, this is the only time you can make an official alliance to where you win the game. So when players make alliances, they'll say, okay, you and me, we're going to go for the game. That way we only need to get four of those strongholds together to win the game. When you make an alliance, you will then give your opponent a card that you had that I showed you at the beginning, these cards here, and that will give them a special ability that they can use, which is also very handy. And so you're working together. Of course, if you build an alliance, someone else might build an alliance. Now, the alliances can be broken only when another temporary ceasefire card comes up. So you might be stuck with that alliance for the rest of the game, but you never know. And one of these cards is going to be turned over each turn. Another thing that's going to be turned over each turn is one of these cards, and this shows a number. This shows five, and this fleet is going to move five sectors. Right now it happens to be in sector 12, so it would go 1, 13, 2, 14, 3, 15, uh, 4, 16, 5, it lands in 17. This planet up here, has a sh this sector has a shield, but this sector here, everything is destroyed, and everything that it moved through is also destroyed. So that fleet is a real pain, you need to make sure you're underneath the shields or that fleet is going to destroy all the influence, but also all the units that are out there. There's a lot more that I could talk about in this game, but some of it is just fun and exciting to find out yourself. So I'm going to let you get into the game yourself, but for right now, let's see what I think of it. I said that I wasn't going to compare it to Dune and I'll talk about all the changes, but I will say that as we played it, 
I, I, I haven't played Dune in, in many years. I played, it a, I played it quite a few times. And as soon as I played this, I instantly remembered how to play Dune. It all came flooding back. And the Baron of Letnev, they were the Harkonnen. So there were times where the spice must flow were set in our games and the Harkonnen and Fremen and all that jazz was brought up. It would have been nice to have the theme. But that being said, I'm not unhappy with the theme the way it is. I think it works. I like the board. I mean, the original board was neat, you know, with the the dip planet. But I like the new, the the big fleet, plastic fleet that flies around. That's total bling, and yet it works in this game because it's neat. Because that fleet, you better run when it's coming. So I like that aspect of the game. I like the six player powers. They're very different. Um, I rank Cosmic Encounter better because there's you know hundreds of different powers that all work together in all different ways. This one, there's only six powers, but these powers are very diverse and very different. One guy, anytime you bid on the cards, the, all the money goes to him. Well, that's pretty neat. That guy has a lot of extra influence laying around. And the, the different powers work together to the point where I will say that while, as far as I can tell, a four-player, five-player game of this work fine, if you want to get ultimate enjoyment out of this game, you want the six-player experience. Now, this game is shorter than Dune was. Dune was a, could be an epic beast, four, five, six hours. This one is going to be shorter. A six-player game for us took a little over three hours. And part of that, I think, is that auction phase. That auction phase just seems to drag on a little more. I wish there was a way to speed it up because the one person can look at every card. And so they'll pull the card, look at it for a while. Okay. And then we auction it on. And I don't know. Maybe it could go a little faster, that part of the game. But for the most part, the rest of the game is pretty quickly. Put troops out, buy troops, move around the board. It's pretty simple. And you'll find yourself caught up in the game at all times. What am I going to do? What's going on? Then that alliance thing is so neat. Now, there's one thing I didn't mention when I was going over the game. It's something that I believe Fantasy Flight added. And there are these trader cards. Basically, you get one. And it's a goal that if you accomplish that goal, at the end of the game, when you win jointly with some other people, which is how I've seen, I think, like 90% of all Dune games end, is with a joint victory, which is yet another thing I like about games. I like games with joint victories. But if you win, you can show this card and say, I've accomplished this goal, so instead of it being a joint victory, I and I alone won. Now, if you do that, somebody else can show one, too, if they've accomplished their goal. And if their number is higher than yours, then they alone have won. So you can sit there and go, you know what? I'm happy with my joint victory. No need to show this card. Because besides, if I show it, someone else might beat me. Or you might not care about that. Or you might just say, hey, I'm happy with a shared victory. I don't need to betray anybody, but you can. And the betrayal aspect of those leaders and uh, the Baron of, of Letnev is my favorite guy to play because I like having four traders and that really can make a difference. You say, well, what's the chance? The chances are high, my friend. The chances are high because there's all this double think. Do they have my best general? Should I use my best general? Because he might die. Okay, I'm not going to use my best general. And there are even times where you can use a traitor, but you don't. You allow them to win a minor battle so that later on, when that big battle comes, they're like, well, I know I can use this guy because he's safe. He is not. He is in my employ, and your army just surrendered. As you can see, this game is the stuff that makes stories. This game is the game that allows awesome things to happen. The stories that I can tell about this from just one game were immense, from multiple games even more so. It's, it's fun. So if you, this sort of thing sounds even remotely interesting to you, you've definitely got to try it out. It's a much more streamlined, shorter version of the game, I think. You can probably play it easy once you know what you're doing in two hours. And for a game with this kind of depth and special abilities, that's really cool. Rex, you may go onto my shelf. And you may stay there because you are a game that is worthy owning. Now go get one and put it on your shelf. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find the latest board game news at Dicetowernews.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Fun Again Games, the world's best game source. Fun Again Games has over 5,000 games available. Check them out at funagain.com.